Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Scott Santon's UBI Enterprise. This episode is inspired by a tweet that Bernie Sanders put out recently. He tweeted, A full employment economy is not a radical idea. A federal job guarantee will lower the crime rate, improve mental health, and create a stronger sense of community. It will create a much healthier and happier America. That phrase full employment made me immediately think about one of my favorite essays. It's titled Full Unemployment. Now this is an essay that I originally read. It was probably one of the first things I ever read about basic income. I read it back in 2013. And the essay itself was a speech that John Bentley gave on December 7th, 2005. So the speech is almost 14 years old at this point. And when I think of things that I've read, there's actually a relative few things that I enjoy reading over and over and over again. And this essay by John Bentley is one of those. I think it's one of the best things written about basic income. And it, it was written 14 years ago. To this day, it's still one of the best things written about basic income. I think it just completely nails what our goal should be. And our goal should not be full employment. I think Bernie Sanders is 100% wrong about full employment being any kind of goal that we should be seeking. And so I want to read this essay by John Bentley because I believe it's just such an important essay. I want more people to be familiar with it and perhaps read it over and over again as I have. And I think that it's just really important that we shift this discussion from full employment to full unemployment. So with that said, this is my reading of a speech delivered by John Bentley titled Full Unemployment that he delivered on December 7th, 2005. We ought to be horrified by these calls for work-life balance. We ought to be for the eradication of work, life without work, and full unemployment. Jermaine Greer has said, quote, I didn't fight to get women out from behind the vacuum cleaner to get them onto the board of Hoover, unquote. There are at least two things we mean when we use the word work. One, effort that a person does to fulfill an aim, as in, this weekend I'll be working on my donkey sculpture. Two, effort done by a person that they would otherwise not do but for economic compulsion, as in, fuck, it's Monday, I have to go to work. We ought not be interested in advocating eradicating work in this first sense. We ought not be interested in eradicating persons' ability to pursue things which require their effort. Indeed, it's likely that a person's life will go as good as the effort they put into it. So from now, work shall be confined to this second definition. Note that this definition of work is not effort that a person does when they are paid. Take the already rich movie star who will be paid $10 million for their next film. They can't be said to be economically compelled in the sense that can be said of the factory worker. That's true even if the movie star is only doing the next film to finance the purchase of a jet airplane. Note also, for those who might be paid something close to the average, for example in a developed nation, who are paid doing something they love to do, that no longer counts as work. Indeed, they might say, oh, it's not work. Even if I had heaps of money, I'd do it anyway. How should we eradicate work and get full unemployment? by any possible means we can invent. To start with, we abolish the minimum wage. We abolish the job search allowance, the Australian Social Security payment. In its place, we have the so-called universal basic income, a weekly payment given to all without condition, expressly without the condition of having to look for work. How much? We set it at the just abolished minimum wage. We increase it over time. 
linked to productivity increases in the general economy. So we should not be satisfied with giving mere basics for life. We as a society ought to start with the basics, then give away as much as we possibly can, much more than the basics in ever-increasing amounts. There was a stream of usual retorts to this proposal of unemployment. Firstly, there is the retort that work is desirable as an end. That is, work is good in and of itself. Too often, people say, I think I'd be bored if I didn't have to work. It's disturbing that a person's sense of possibility has atrophied to such an extent. It's as if they can only see a choice between working and doing nothing. They probably will be bored if they can't imagine having such things in their life as sport, travel, art, music, a whole train of activity that is desirable as an end. Perhaps they simply can't act unless under forced instruction. If that's the case, we don't need work for that. We can build a website www.yourdailytask.com Today you take a big inflatable ball to the park. Roll it up the hill. When you get the top of the hill, release it. Let roll back to the bottom. Those that are free of work might even volunteer to monitor those who require forced instruction for their satisfaction. They could offer harsh words, for example. This view that work is good in itself, another has called work fetishism. The second group of retorts concede work is not desirable as an end, but maintain it is necessary as a means. Another way to express these group of retorts is with the charge that full unemployment is utopian. This charge means a few different things. Firstly, the charge full unemployment is utopian, sometimes means that utopias cause death and misery. Look at all the death and misery that's been wrought by people advancing their utopias, Stalin, Hitler, Mao. But that's to criticize those particular utopias. It doesn't follow that all utopias must cause misery. The pursuit of the utopia, for example, no deaths from aviation accidents, causes less death and misery. If we are denied the concept of a utopia, we must give up on advocating any political change, for to speak of a utopia is speak of how things might be better. The charge full unemployment is utopian sometimes means this doesn't take into account fundamental factors at play in any possible practical world. Isn't your proposition absurd? Trying to get rid of work by removing workers is like trying to get rid of crime by removing lawyers. So too, I'd like to not have to work, but if I want things like food, jumper, a surfboard, then someone has to produce it. There lies the chief fallacy that underpins the paradigm of full employment. It equates material wealth with work. The chief fallacy that for people to have material wealth, human effort is required to get it. Sunshine is material wealth, but no one throughout human history has labored to create it. Not even a god. We get sunshine without effort, and therefore without work. But nature doesn't provide surfboards. Are you abdicating some sort of back to nature downshifting? Some sort of lowering of standard of living? No, the opposite. Let a machine build the surfboard. Let the labor-saving devices be used for the novel application of saving labor. A second mechanism to bring us toward full unemployment, in addition to a universal basic income, is to automate anything that can be automated. Next, full unemployment is utopian may mean that it's practically impossible to achieve a complete implementation of the ideal. You might be able to automate surfboard production, but what about food? To get food, someone has to farm it. There is no in-principle obstacle to automating farming. 
Conceptually, it's straightforward to imagine greenhouses with robots tending the tomatoes and harvesting them at the right time. Those tomatoes thrown down underground electromagnetic pipes that speed them to your kitchen. But ah, you will need someone to maintain the robots. You haven't eradicated work completely. You haven't achieved a complete implementation of full unemployment. Right now, thousands of computer programmers develop and maintain thousands of pieces of software. They do so without pay, and they give their software away without cost. Sometimes they can yield products superior to the commercial equivalents, the Firefox web browser, for example. So there is no reason to think that the maintenance of farming robots could not be carried out by humans who do it free from economic compulsion. That is, who do it without working. But ah, there are nevertheless tasks that are not amenable to automation at all, like being a teacher or a lawyer. Artificial intelligence concerns aside, I want to grant this. There are some tasks that are not so conceptually straightforward to automate. But all such tasks are activities that people do find intrinsically worthwhile. Being a teacher or lawyer are things that people would choose to do. Such tasks do have intrinsic value. We do not even have to consider those people who are sometimes motivated to do things out of an ethical concern. However, let's assume this to be false. Let's assume that either some payment must be given to the teacher or the robot maintainer. Let's assume there must be economic compulsion or, less odiously, financial incentive some of the time to get some things done. Let's assume that a full eradication of work is not practically possible. Recall the utopian vision, the ideal in aviation safety. There should be no deaths from aviation accidents. It's an ideal that can't be fully achieved. No matter how many safety improvements we make, there will always be the occasional fatal accident. Despite that, aviation authorities move in the direction of the ideal. The global accident rates of commercial jets per number of departures have been declining at least since 1959. What we don't say is, let's aim for flight death balance. What we don't say is, aviation can never be totally safe, therefore we should send out a few engineers to loosen a few bolts to increase the numbers of people killed in accidents. If achieving a complete implementation of the ideal of full unemployment is not practically possible, at least we can and should move in that direction. Next, the charge full unemployment is utopian sometimes means it's not practically possible to achieve even a partial implementation of the ideal. If you are using examples like automated farming, then it sounds like you are talking about a utopia after all, some distant future requiring technical conditions that simply don't exist today. Firstly, although I've proposed that we use automation to save labor, that's not the only means. Imagine there are a handful of us plane wrecked on a remote island. We have been on the island for a long while, and we live in caves near the beach. All of us still have to work for our basic needs. Each individual spends three hours in the morning gathering their daily food from the thankfully abundant forest. Alas, the only source of water is from a spring at the top of the mountain. In the afternoon, each of us spends three hours on the return journey to fill our bucket for our daily water needs. To get to the top of the mountain, we take a route that skirts the island, and this route starts west. One day, Lisa Simpson announces, I've tried the route east. It only takes one and a half hours. Fuck. Lisa has discovered a means to get exactly what we required before, but in less time and with less work, and she has done this without automation. Lisa has simply identified a more efficient way to do things. 
From now on, we walk east, and while producing and consuming the same quantity of wealth, some work has been eliminated. This work was not necessary for the wealth that we got. So we have a third mechanism to bring us closer to full unemployment, identifying efficiencies. Just in case you think this example is somehow too artificial, consider the National Australia Bank. In May of this year, 2005, it cut 2,000 jobs after announcing a 17% increase in profit. Even Australian Treasurer Peter Costello remarked, The National Australia Bank better have a pretty good explanation because the National Australia Bank, as you know, is a highly profitable organization. The CEO's explanation for the job cuts, from memory, was, We've found efficiencies within the organization. Right now, not in a distant utopian future, Efficiency gains save labor. Notionally, I'm not suggesting this course. The CEO could give employees more time off at their same weekly pay. Back though to automation, for I spoke of automating farming. Consider the recent past with respect to garbage removal in Sydney. A few years ago, the norm in all Sydney suburbs was to have a driver plus two garbos running around the truck emptying bins into the back. These days, in some suburbs, one person only needs to drive the truck and a mechanical arm seizes the bin and empties into the back. Right now, not in a distant utopian future, automation saves labor. We can take a step back from the National Australia Bank and garbage truck example to consider what they illustrate in general terms. Material progress gives us two things. One, it gives us new material power, a new good or service that didn't exist before, as when the Wright brothers invented the powered airplane. Two, and or it gives us increased productivity. That is, we can output more goods and services relative to the inputs of capital and labor. Note that production, all the goods and services that is produced, can decrease while productivity increases. Increases in productivity can occur in at least one or both of two ways that have been exemplified. One, through discovering efficiencies, or two, through automation. Under our current economic system, productivity increases are returned in one or more of five ways. One, higher profits to the owners of capital. Two, lower prices to the consumer. Three, higher wages to the worker. Four, increases in absolute growth. The total amount of production increases. That is, we make more. Five, shifting the worker into a different job. But there is a sixth option. We could give the worker more free time. The current economic system just doesn't include any mechanism to give people free time. Contemporary notions of increases in quality of life or standards of living do not include more free time. This ought to be the first priority of an economic system. Giving people free time ought to be the end to which other parts of the economy are a means. Are the National Australia Bank and Garbage Truck examples exceptional? Are productivity increases, whether from efficiency gains or automation, rare? No. Let's look at a small subset of the Australian economy. Productivity increases for the whole of the Australian economy are measured. From the Australian Bureau of Statistics website, productivity can be measured in a variety of ways. The most comprehensive Australian measure available at present is multi-factor productivity for the market sector. Multi-factor productivity represents that part of the growth in output that cannot be explained by growth in labor and capital inputs. During the decade 1993-94 to 2003-2004, Australia experienced improved rates of productivity growth and multi-factor productivity rose 1.5% per year on average. 
Now, let alone in some distant future, we could maintain the production of wealth or even continue to increase it while decreasing the amount of labor in the process. The point about considering a distant future with advanced automation is to show that under our current economic paradigm, no matter how much productivity increases, 38 hours would still be regarded as ordinary working hours. The point about considering a distant future with different conditions is to not have to wait for it before starting on the path to eliminating work. Another retort against the proposition we ought to just give everyone money so that they don't have to work is, who will do the shit jobs? Who will clean the sewers? Or less literally, who will pick apples off the tree? Before addressing the question directly, we should note what the question reveals about our current economic paradigm. It underlines that we believe there are jobs generally less desirable to do and that there should be people who are compelled to do them. The question reveals that we expect and require a master-servant class system for the proper functioning of society. There should be some people who are forced to do shit jobs so that other people don't have to do them. Under our system, it is the shit jobs, the more menial, the more meaningless, the less intrinsically rewarding jobs that attract the lower wage. So who will do the shit jobs? Firstly, a great deal of shit jobs ought to be eliminated straight up. There are a great deal of many shit jobs whose principal value lies in them peddling the idea that the consumer is part of a master class. A waiter is such a job. There should be no waiters. Just as petrol stations eradicated Bowser attendance not long ago, we can and ought eliminate waiters from restaurants. Secondly, those that do the shit jobs ought to be paid as much or more than those who are fortunate enough to get to do the meaningful jobs. And the mechanism to do both of these things? The UBI. What we ought have is an economy where what gets made is determined not only if there is a consumer demand for it, but a worker demand for the meaningfulness and equity of the conditions of the work. Under the dominant economic system, when we speak of markets, in general this covers two markets in particular. One, a market for goods and services, a force that mediates the relationship between consumers and suppliers. Two, a market for labor, a force that mediates the relationship between employer and employee. In the market for goods and services, there is a sense in which the consumer is empowered. If there is no consumer demand for something, it won't get made. If you get a difficult time from a company as consumer, you can go elsewhere. This is a free market in a theoretically pure form where we assume no advertising, no monopoly, and a person actually has enough money to be a consumer. You might wish to add other assumptions to prop this up. There is a sense in which the consumer is lord. The consumer is lord even in the market for labor. Sure, there is sometimes a power that the worker has. If a worker has specialist skill that's in demand, then they can command a higher wage. But the demand for that skill ultimately does not come from employers. It comes from consumers. For an employer is only providing something that a consumer has demand for. Therefore, what these markets have in common is a force, ultimately driven by consumers, that only cares about what gets made. There is nothing in the market force that operates on whether the meaningfulness of the work done, the joy in performing the task, will be equitably distributed to the workers. So in Mumbai, India, where six million people live in slums, you get child laborers whose work is perfectly consistent with the contemporary market force. They can work barefoot in the garbage dump, picking up plastic or metal to recycle for up to $2, or work factories under appalling conditions, earning between 16 cents and $1.35 for their 12-hour shift. Meanwhile, Australian schools 
for the kids of parents who have done well for market forces and historical legacy, put on Dickens' Oliver Twist, sometimes as a musical no less, as a quaint depiction of a bygone era whose primary value lies in its being a vehicle to exercise dramatic talent. Think of these contemporary market forces. Imagine I want to build a widget, and I have capital, but not enough. I seek more capital and approach venture capitalists. For them to give me money, I have to convince them there will be a consumer demand for my widget. So whether the thing gets made or not depends mostly on whether there will be this demand. There is this market force that operates on what gets made and even the quality of the finished product. If I can't generate this consumer demand, the product does not get made. The market says, tough cookies, mate, game over. Now I need to hire workers to make it happen. The more specialized job, and therefore likely to be more interesting and engaging, will require me to pay more money. There already is a market force for specialized skilled work. Why? Because such skilled work is rare. I can hire someone to do the more menial functions, for example, clean the office and the shithouse. That's not too skilled. And I can pay someone to do that at a far lower wage. Why? Because the ability to do that is common. And for many people, they don't have much option. It's no good saying if you were the person who asked who will do the shit jobs, they can just go to technical college and learn a new skill. Then you are imagining it possible to everyone to be so skilled that no one has any greater claim not to do the shit jobs. If we had a UBI, this would introduce a new force in the labor market. Not just a market force that consumers ultimately leverage, but a new market force that workers can leverage. This would restore a balance of power. Here is a bit more explicit detail about the universal basic income. The universal basic income is set at X. Every individual gets the same amount. But while a full implementation of the ideal is not reached, paid work can exist alongside it. A great deal of many people will want X plus Y more than the universal basic income, and they'd be free to do paid work. The pool of people willing to do the more menial jobs at the low wage will be radically shrunk. So in order to get the office cleaned, I might have to, one, pay much more than before for the work, or two, we who already work in the company will have to share the undesirable task, or three, not clean the office, Four, invent a new way to minimize or eliminate human effort in cleaning the office. Or five, not make the widget. The UBI creates a market force for the equitable distribution of the meaningful and the shit work. So if I come up with an idea for a product, I now have to satisfy two market hoops. One, that there will be a consumer demand for it. Two, and that there will be an equitable distribution of meaningful work, or the shit work will be compensated much more fairly, the shit work attracting a bigger wage. If I can't satisfy both market hoops, then tough, it doesn't get made. In other words, we create a market force for not only what gets made, but for how it gets made. The retort at hand is, is to deny that a partial implementation of full unemployment is practically possible. I'll expand upon how a partial implementation of a full unemployment might work today. There is problem with giving the bank or garbage worker days off when productivity increases occur in these industries. Those industries might be more prone to efficiency gains or automation. A teacher or lawyer, as we move toward full unemployment, ought share in the productivity increases that will happen in other industries first. It's more equitable to pool productivity gains through the device of a universal basic income so everyone might choose to work five minutes less. 
So when the garbage truck comes along with a mechanical arm, the three workers can job share and be paid the same hourly rate, but get less total pay. For the Garbos, that's not as disturbing as our current situation, for they will be getting a universal basic income. The savings in labor costs for the council can get largely passed over to the pool for the universal basic income. So we have this fourth means to full employment in addition to the UBI automation and efficiency gains. A liberation contribution fee. Whenever you lay off workers while your organization's income is maintained or increasing, 75% of what you formerly paid the workers gets handed over to the universal basic income pool. You might be persuaded that the ideal of full unemployment is approachable after all. You might nevertheless feel that if we instituted now a universal basic income, this would only promote immediate economic collapse. If no one is required to work, then everyone will just go off to the beach to surf Malibus and wealth won't be created. Firstly, as just mentioned, while short of the ideal, people can be free to get paid for work and so acquire more than the UBI. Many people will want more than the UBI. Secondly, just because people aren't in paid work, it doesn't follow they don't make enormous contributions to the social material good. There is a great deal of activity that individuals do that benefit society that are not recognized in the formal economy. Feminism, for example, revealed this dark secret in the case of women's domestic labor. There is the example of the open source software movement and Olympic volunteers. There is good reason to believe that liberating people from the necessity of paid work will increase their ability to contribute to the wealth of society. It makes labor more mobile. Let's recall the garbage worker example. Let's assume that the garbage worker doesn't have specialized skills that are in demand. Under our current system, she may find it difficult to acquire new skills once laid off. She's got to pay the rent and so might be forced into waiting tables, for example. She can still attend night school, but she's fucked after the day's work. If there was no urgency because she had a UBI, she could dedicate all of the best of her energy to learning some new skill. She could attend day school. If people are free from paid work, then greater entrepreneurial risk can be taken. If I propose to a few others that I've got a great widget in mind and that it would take us six months to develop, are they in? Under the current conditions, they might be less inclined. What they risk is economic ruin if it doesn't work out. With a UBI, the worst case scenario is that the widget doesn't make any money and you lose any investment capital. You can't lose basic access to food, etc. It is possible with a UBI that we all work without pay for six months on the risk we will make money, or the activity has some merit regardless of whether money is made. This might be persuasive. It might be conceded that a partial implementation of full unemployment is possible. There might be an acceptance that a UBI will not entail that everyone just surfs Malibus on the beach. Nevertheless, some might surf Malibus. Some might never make any contribution to society. Isn't that inherently unfair? No, not at all. Well, we are short of the ideal of full unemployment, we have the UBI existing alongside a paid labor market. If someone wants more than the UBI by doing paid work, then that's their choice. Everyone would be exposed to the same choice equally. Everyone is free to take the UBI only. It's fair secondly, because if you are surfing Malibus all day, you don't compete for the job another applied for. You facilitate 
others chance of getting a job that gives them an income above the UBI? Should the surfer be given social benefits without them having to contribute? Let's return to the remote island. Recall that all of us still have to work for our basic needs. Each individual spends three hours in the morning gathering their daily food. And because of Lisa's efficiency gain, we spend only one and a half hours on the return journey to fill our bucket for our daily water needs. Imagine Lisa then comes up with an idea to build a pipe from the spring to the village. She tries to enlist some assistance. Some people agree to help. Others say, I'd rather not. After my four and a half hours of toil, I'd rather go surfing. So some of us spend three months building this pipe, which fills a trough in the village, providing more than enough for everyone. Now those of us who built the pipe don't have to spend one and a half hours each afternoon fetching water. We just take our bucket to the trough. The important question that splits political opinion is, what arrangement should we who built the pipe come to with those that did not build the pipe? Under our current economic paradigm, we ought lock the trough up in a hut and trade the water. Thinking of the most generous example under the paradigm, we do something like divide the number of hours it took to build the pipe amongst the number of builders. We use that figure to determine how many hours of food gathering a surfer would have to do to pay for access to water. Once a surfer has given a pipe builder a sufficient number of hours worth of food, then the surfer is allowed unlimited access to the water. Those who feel individuals should be arranged to serve society might feel this is a fair arrangement. I'd suggest Lisa and her pipe building mates ought properly be called cunts. What the pipe builders ought to do upon completion of the pipe is give everyone free access to the water without condition. A society that does that is a better society. In case you think this example is too artificial, music distribution is facing this very issue. The pipe to the source of music has been built. The internet now allows you to copy music for free, but that's illegal. The music could be free, and the artists and music distributors could be supported by a UBI. Note the global positioning system is like this. Right now, 28 satellites orbiting the planet as beacons to the best of American communism, something centrally planned, communally funded, and whose benefit requires no fee upon end-user consumption. The United States spends $400 million annually maintaining this system. Even non-U.S. citizens can access the signal freely. Every individual around the globe has free access to the signal notwithstanding that at a couple of hundred bucks the receiver is beyond most people's means. It's unfair and immoral that people should be required to work for others' unfettered and frivolous material desires. I've suggested that with the UBI, people will still contribute to society. It's likely that this would increase their tendency to contribute. However, that sort of justification is dangerous as it panders to another fallacy that underpins the paradigm of full employment. That people ought be principally valued as a means, the extent to which they contribute to society. Bertrand Russell had observed that a fundamental difference between political opinion is between those who believe individuals should be arranged to contribute to society and those who believe society should be arranged to contribute to individuals. There is a sense in which this is not circular wordplay. The pipe to water example above draws out that difference. I can recall a documentary on the age discrimination of workers in their 40s. Sometimes part of their appeal to be employed was based on the phrase but I still have many years left as a productive member of society. We should stop valuing people insofar 
as they are productive members of society. We as a society should not be valuing individuals at all, but rather creating the conditions where individuals can pursue what they value. The purpose to which production should be put is to give people greater freedom. People should not be put to the purpose of production. The purpose to which our production should be put is so that people can surf Malibus all the time if they want. Return to the hypothetical island. Imagine there is Barry. He comes up with an idea that we make several trips back up the mountain to mine blue powder. With sufficient quantities of the blue powder, after three months of hard work, we can paint our face blue. Your proper response should be, well, you go right ahead. I can't see any value painting my face blue. Now imagine Barry says, if you don't help me with a few of my mates, I'll bar your access to the water trough. Your proper response would be, get the fuck out. It is immoral of you to attempt to take away access to what I currently get for free because of your quirky tastes. Of course, this is the cosmetic industry. A whole industry attracting capital and labor for a completely frivolous end so women can paint their faces. Instead of using capital and labor so that women could paint their face, we could notionally, I'm not recommending this course, halt the industry, do without face painting, and give the savings directly to the cosmetic industry workers to do with as they please. I'm not wishing to pick on women. We could do the same to the industries of bottled water, advertising, sports shoes, insurance, and waiting tables functions. There are whole industries whose output is frivolous compared to the work that sustains it. So you're down on luxuries like female cosmetics, sounding a bit Taliban there, sounding close to the kind of utopian vision that oppresses and causes suffering. There should be no interest in banning people from producing and consuming these things. What we ought to be for is that people should first be free from an economy that compels them to work so these frivolous things can exist. There are two other false beliefs that hold back moving in the direction of full unemployment. Absolute growth of stuff with its evil twin, absolute growth in population. There is the false notion that we need absolute growth of stuff. That is, to increase material wealth, we need always absolute increases in material wealth. Increases in absolute material wealth sometimes create scarcity. For example, when the sum total of cars on the roads increases, traffic jams increase, causing a decrease in material wealth for everyone in virtue of trips taking longer. This leads to the creation of unnecessary work. More roads are built. If we increase Sydney's population, we create a scarcity of water. Desalination plants are built, creating unnecessary work. Smaller shower heads are distributed. The better measure is per capita growth. We should create more for each, not simply more total stuff. That's to say nothing of the equality of distribution, nor of non-material wealth. What we should do is implement global population shrink to prevent work being created and to increase per capita wealth. We ought not create work. We ought not create absolute growth in wealth or population. We ought create per capita growth. Work, the effort done by a person that they would otherwise not do but for economic compulsion, can be totally eradicated. We can achieve full unemployment. The ideal of no work 
is unlike the ideal no deaths from airplane accidents. A complete implementation of the ideal of no work is practically achievable. Even if that's wrong, and a complete implementation is not possible, that does not count against us moving toward this ideal. Underlying the current economic paradigm is some false beliefs that fuel the opposite ideal. One, that work is good as an end in itself. Work fetishism. If someone is not telling you which acts to perform and there is no economic compulsion to act, there are intrinsically worthwhile acts that you can choose to do. Sport, travel, art, sex, etc. Two, that people won't do things that have a social benefit unless they are paid for it. The Firefox browser is created by people without pay and given away for free. Three, that human effort is necessary for material wealth. Sunshine exists. We can take the shorter route to water or attach a robotic arm to garbage trucks and so eliminate effort. What policies could we implement right now to move us toward full unemployment? A universal basic income. An unconditional weekly payment given to everyone. The payment is linked to productivity increases in the general economy. A liberation contribution fee. Whenever an enterprise lays off workers while maintaining or increasing revenue, 75% of what it would have spent on workers' pay is channeled to the collective pool for the universal basic income. Productivity increases, whether from efficiency gains or automation, would be returned in part as increases in free time. Alone, these two policies would have some desirable effects. One, the introduction of a force in the labor market acting upon the equitability of the meaningfulness of doing work. Two, and it would become difficult to pay low wages for shit jobs. This will eliminate a lot of work that is meaningless, menial, or purely subservient. This will eliminate businesses that depend on such work. Conclusion In one way, the modern worker is worse off than the ancient slave. For at least the slave seeks freedom. The modern worker, on the contrary, seeks more work. The modern worker elects governments who strive for full employment. The lives of individuals ought not be arranged so that they may be productive, so that they may contribute to society. That's getting it the arse way around. The reason for a society, the reason for an economy, ought be so that individuals may have freely lived lives. Freely lived lives rather than a flourishing life. For if a sane and competent person seeks social assistance to harm themselves, that ought be provided. We ought not see individuals as a means for production. We ought see production as the means for individuals. The chief purpose of material wealth and progress ought be to increase our freedom. We should not live to work, and we should not work to live. We should live. Freedom is possible.